I read this week, true Christianity is not just about the things that we believe, but it's the lives that we live. It's not about the theological positions that we hold to, but it's about the daily, personal communication and contact we have with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and how that impacts and affects our day to day. As a church, we began the year considering our mission, our purpose once more of knowing Jesus more and making Jesus more known. And when we condense it down to that, we understand that it means so much more. That to know Jesus more isn't just to fill our heads with facts, but it's to go deeper into a relationship with him. And that, as a knock-on effect of being more and more in closeness and community with Jesus, that we will be transformed into his likeness. That to know Jesus more will mean that we will look more like Jesus. And as we draw closer to Jesus, as we love him more as we ought, as we, we get close enough to see truly how beautiful he is and to be changed by that, we'll want to invite more and more people into that relationship. Do you know that's a really similar conversation to the one that Jesus had eh, with a certain expert in the law that's recorded for us in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 verse 25, we read that there was a teacher of the law who stood up to test Jesus, which is always a fun idea, as if he was the one who could sign off on Jesus's uh, validity, Jesus' rightness, but apparently this is what he did. He stood up to test Jesus and he asked this question. Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I like the question, actually, because even just pulling that apart this morning may be enough for us to ponder this week. I love the idea that this expert in the law is sharing that life in its fullest sense, we don't yet possess that there is something more to life than what we often consider life to be at the moment. More than just our waking, our eating, our working, our playing. That there is an eternal life to inherit. My fear is though, that with our modern years, with our modern eyes, we translate that to mean a quantity of life. That when the expert is asking, when Jesus answers about eternal life, we think about life after death, life beyond the grave, life that begins when our soul is separated from our body and we float off to this heavenly realm and that that life lasts forever. I think that's a misstep and I think that's unfortunate because the only other time that Jesus speaks about eternal life, actually, he's not speaking about a quantity, he's speaking about a quality. Jesus in John chapter 17, he's praying and he says, this is what eternal life is, that they would know you, the one true God, Father in heaven and the Jesus who you have sent. It's not about something that begins when we die, it's not about a spirit or a soul that is separated from our body. It's not about a length of time or a time without end that begins at a certain point, but it's about a quality of life. It's about being in relationship with our creator, with our very author, with our sustainer, with the one true God and the son he sent to call us back to himself. That's, that's why I love this question. And why it resonated with me having heard that quote from J.C. Ryle this week. That true Christianity isn't just about how we think or the, the theological positions that we hold. But it's how we live day to day in relationship with God. In relationship with Jesus here and now. Jesus answers the expert of the Lord, doesn't he? He doesn't answer him. He asks him another question back. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you're the expert in the law. You tell me, what does the law say you're supposed to do to inherit eternal life? He'd had a similar conversation. It's recorded for us in John's gospel, 
conversation that actually turned into a bit of an argument. And he says, you foolish scribes and teachers, you search the scriptures because you believe that in them you find life, that you would have life, that you would know life. These are the very scriptures that testify to me, and yet you will not come to me for life. That's what he said there. Here he just asks this expert, what does the law say? What does the law say on how you should inherit, how you should gain, how you should move into and walk to and take possession of eternal life? Next, what the law says this. Love God with everything, heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbour as yourself. And that should sound familiar to us because A, this story is familiar, but B, it's a formulation that Jesus himself used. When he was probed, when he was questioned about a summation or the, 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 the most important things in the law, this is the exact formulation that he used. It was a way commonly of distilling down all the teaching that, that gathered together and around in the Torah of God rescuing that people out of Egypt. Israel, his own possession, of forming a covenant with them, of being their God and them being um, his people. To sum up all of that, love God, love your neighbour. Jesus says, you're right. That is how you enter into, take possession of eternal life. Eternal life is that. Eternal life is when you begin to love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself do that jesus says and you will live not you will enter into life not you will go to the good place rather than the bad place when you die you will live now i think that's wonderfully challenging for us this morning when we stop to consider what faith truly is all about when we stop to consider what life is all about an eternal life and life beyond death and more importantly life before death jesus says this is life to come to him to know god to love god and to love one another do you know that is what we were made for that is what we were created for that is what Jesus came to do in amongst us and for us and call us to follow him into. Not just life that continues when we die, but life that begins now in him. But there's a weight to that, isn't there? And the teacher of the law feels that weight because loving God with everything and loving our neighbour does not come naturally to us. In fact, by nature, we reject God and we invent gods of our own making. We say no to the one who made us and sustains us and yes to anything and everything else. And we don't love even our nearest and dearest as we should. Instead, we love ourselves at the expense of those around us. And so this wonderfully simple law of love, loving God and loving one another, of living life in relationship with Jesus and following after Jesus, because after all, this is how he lived his life, loving the Father and loving, even laying down his life for us, following after him, we feel the weight of it as just being more than we are able to bear. And then if that is the path to eternal life, well, then we will sadly fall short. And the teacher of the law feels this weight. And he does what comes naturally to all of us, which is to try and to narrow it down a little bit. If maybe I can carve out a small sliver, a small segment of society that I can call my neighbour, well, then, then yes, I can keep that command and I can be confident that I am entering into eternal life. So he asks the question, who is my neighbour? And Jesus, ever helpfully, doesn't answer the question plainly, but tells a story. And it's a story in which we don't find a definition for who is my neighbour, but what it means for us to be a neighbour to someone else. The story goes like this. There's a certain man, he's walking a certain road, it's a dangerous path from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's attacked, 
and he's robbed and he's beaten and he's left half dead. I love that expression in the story, half dead. Literally alive and dead at the same time, right on the knife's edge. Could easily fall either way at any point. Drama, tension, will this individual survive? Will they make it through to the end of the story? A priest happens to be walking by. Hurrah, our hopes, our dreams, our expectations, they're uplifted because this one, this one set apart amongst God's people to, to bring people into the presence of God, to aid people and assist people in their worship to God. This person who knows the law and the ritual and the ceremonies that please God, he's gonna see someone in need and he's gonna act. Only he doesn't. He sees the man and he says he passes by on the other side of the street. My guess is, He's terrified. He's terrified that if he goes over to intervene, that he's just gonna end up in exactly the same state, that he's gonna get mugged, that he's gonna be beaten up, and that he's gonna be left for dead. So he passes by. Let's not judge him too harshly. Who amongst us would not do or has not done the exact same thing? And a second character pops up, a Levite. Someone whose job it was in the temple to help the priest in offering the sacrifices and aiding and abetting the worship of the people of God to the one true God. If the priest wouldn't help, surely this is the one to do it. Surely this is the hero the story has been waiting for. But just as he's walking the same path and he sees the same man, he does exactly the same thing. He walks on, he passes by, he doesn't break stride. We're waiting still for someone to appear who is going to show love, who is going to show compassion, who is going to show mercy and kindness and intervene to risk their own lives, to, to, to spend of themselves, to heal and to restore this individual. And it says then, not a Levite, not a priest, but a Samaritan. A Samaritan is walking that same way. Now, just a little history lesson for you. Israel, the Jews, and the Samaritans did not like each other. They once were part of the same nation, but civil war divided them between the north and the south. They both went off into exile. They were reformed in part during exile, but Samaria kept its own identity or muddled its identity really through intermarriage, its, its modes of worship, the things that it valued, to the extent where Jesus' day, Samaria and the Israelites, they hated each other. It was a hate-hate relationship. To call someone a Samaritan was a, a derogatory thing. It was an accusation that was thrown at Jesus. In the same breath, he was described as being demon-possessed. That's what we're talking about. That was the, the feeling and the attitude towards Samaritans. And the Samaritan appears, the same path, sees the same man in the same situation, but... But, Jesus says, he took pity on him. He had compassion on him. And more than just feeling sorry for this individual on the side of the road. This is what happens. He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, he pours oil and wine on him, then he puts this man on his own donkey and takes him to an inn to take care of him. We're supposed to be at this point gobsmacked at this individual's behavior. Not because looking after someone is, is, is a crazy thing to do, we know it's the right thing to do, but because of who is doing it. This person who's supposed to be an enemy of the man on the side of the street shows compassion, love, and care. And more than just doing the right thing, he goes the extra mile. He gives the innkeeper some extra money. He says, I'm going away for a while, but don't worry. You look after him until he's fully restored. And if I come back and you spend any more money, I will repay every single penny. Remember? The discussion was how do we enter into eternal life, life, the fullest life, life abundant, quality of life in relationship with Jesus that starts now 
We're supposed to love God and, and through that love, God be transformed into, into loving one another. But we feel the weight of that and, and, and the burden of that because none of us can do it. And so we ask our qualifying questions. Well, well, who is it that we're supposed to love? And Jesus says, you tell me. He actually asks the expert of the law, who in this story was neighborly? And the expert rightly identifies it was the one who had mercy on this poor fellow. And all Jesus has left to say is this, you go and do likewise. Because our neighbor is not someone we can define, or they're people who live within half a mile of me. My neighbor is my most immediate family. My neighbor is anyone who is Welsh and from Wales. No, a neighbor is someone that we can be transformed by the love of God into someone who likewise cares and shows kindness to those who need it. Go and do likewise. See, Jesus isn't asking us to do something that he's unwilling to do himself. Jesus was someone from far away who we were, in our own minds, in our thoughts, and in our behaviours, enemies of. So Paul puts it in Colossians. He says, you are enemies strangers, aliens towards God, in your, in your attitudes, in your thoughts, in your behaviours. And yet Christ came. Christ entered in. Christ did what was necessary to take us from death into eternal life. And Jesus has been saying in Luke, before we took our break for the summer, that he has come to live, to lay down his life, to suffer, to die, but to rise again and to enter into glory so that we can enter into glory with him. And he's invited us on that path too. And so when Jesus says to us, go and do likewise, Jesus is asking us, he's inviting us to do and to follow the very footsteps that he has walked out himself. Luke chapter 8, I think it is, chapter 6 perhaps, is this discussion of what it is to be a follower of his. And he says the student is not greater than the teacher, but the students, when they are mature, will be like their teacher. You know, when we know Jesus more, when we have that daily relationship with him, when we love God with all of our hearts and with all of our minds and with all of our souls and all of our strength, we will be changed, we will be transformed, we will become people who know God and love God and love one another. You see, the danger for us is twofold, really, as people. is one that we would miss that first rung in the lag of that first step on the journey. That most important of all is to love God. And that we can love God, or we can know God in Jesus. Jesus is the one who has come to reveal God to us. To, to show us how loved we are and to love him in response. And we can miss that and we can forget that. We can wander away from that. But we can also forget that that has implications, that that has an impetus, that that has an imperative for us to live different lives. Jesus' brother James put it like this, that faith without works is dead. That if we only know more about Jesus and are not changed by him, then we are nothing at all. That we are not living the lives that we were created to live. Eternal life is ours even now when we follow after Jesus into loving the Father and loving one another. Can I share with you, before we finish quickly, a few examples that encourage me within the life of our church, some older, some newer, of how people have been transformed and changed and the love that they have experienced in Jesus, the love that they have for Jesus has led them to practically love those who ordinarily they may not have. The first one is, surprisingly or not, the food bank. It's been going for donkey's years now and hundreds if not thousands of people have been helped. People perhaps that many in our community would say are undeserving 
that their crisis, that their situations that they find themselves in are situations of their own making and they're situations they should get themselves out of. But we as a church and certain individuals within our church in particular have spent their time, have spent their energy, have spent their emotions not just once, not just twice, but week in, week out, loving for, caring for, showing kindness and compassion for those people near us who need it. Not because they think that is going to earn them a ticket to heaven when they die, but because they know, they understand that real eternal life starts now, and that as they love God, that they're drawn closer into to him through Jesus, that they're also being sent out to love and to care and to minister those in need. The second example is a bit newer, but perhaps we've made less of, we may never even have mentioned on a Sunday morning before. It's something that was birthed during lockdown and it is the charity shop Renew in town. Renew, if you don't know what it is, it's open one day a week. It's a collection point for people in our community to donate clothes, homewares, toys, you name it, they'll take it, not in order to sell, but to give away freely. And one day a week, it is open for anyone in our community to come and to take as they need. And it has been wonderful through the lockdown as folks have struggled and as we come out of lockdowns and as more and more people come in, that those in our communities who genuinely have needs are able to come and to receive. Um, expecting mothers who can't afford prams and buggies and baby clothes receiving. Parents of kids in schools who are constantly growing out of school clothes or uh, at, the, at the mercy of schools that are changing their rules and their regulations, being able to come and get school clothes. Refugees who are in our country because they, their own countries are being ripped and ravaged by war and they come and they have nothing coming and receiving and not just receiving the material things but being loved, being welcomed being received by the people who work in the shop. I'd love for that to grow. Maybe if you want to be involved in that, come and give us a word. But the example that I saw this week, which really warmed my heart, I wasn't expecting it, it just happened out of the blue, was of someone sitting with a young Syrian lady reading a children's book in one of the cafes in Amford. You know, this lady's attitude wasn't if you learn English, if you learn my culture, then maybe we can go out and have a nice coffee. Her attitude was, come with me. Let me invest in you. Let me love you. I can only assume that it was out of compassion and out of love that she reached out and showed kindness to this individual. Such an example to me, such an encouragement to me. How do we inherit eternal life? I mean, you, you haven't needed the last 20 odd minutes of me rambling on that. The answer is literally there. It's loving God and it's loving our neighbours with everything that we have. Simple thing, but it weighs so much on us. Jesus says, do you know what? I've done the heavy lifting and I invite you to follow me into it. Not something that we need to wait for, hope for in the future, something can be experienced right now as we draw nearer to him and as we go out and draw near to those who need us. Father, I thank you that we are first and foremost recipients of our great neighbour, Jesus, who drew near to us. There was no link that made it that he should, but he could and he did. We thank you so much for that. We thank you that he opens our eyes and reveals to us truly your love for us in our desperate and dire situation. That we can see you and know you and glorify you and enjoy you through Jesus. Lord, we take seriously the challenge, the invitation that he gives us. Not just to love ourselves while we wait for glory, 
but through a love for you to love those who need us now. Be with us as we move into this new turn, Lord God. As we continue to draw and walk closer with Jesus. That we wouldn't be cloistered. We wouldn't just be confined to our own theological positions. But we would be walking out in faith, in love, in compassion to those that you have placed us amongst. For your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.